Hello, welcome to another edition of The Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace. As you know here on The Pace Report, I always keep my eyes and ears on all five boroughs to showcase where jazz music is unfolding. And tonight here on The Pace Report, I was honored to go to Jamaica, Queens to cover jazz pianist Angelica Sanchez, who hails from Phoenix, Arizona. Now, for over the last 20 years, Angelica has played with and recorded with the likes of Paul Motion, Richard Davis, and the great Wadada Leo Smith, just to name it many in his few. She has a dynamic album out right now called Sparkle Beans, which features bassist Michael Fromanek, as well as drummer Billy Hart. Tonight, she's performing music at the Jamaica Center for the Arts and Learning in downtown Jamaica, Queens. And I had a chance to sit down with her before I said to talk about her important influences, including the great Mary Lou Williams and the great Duke Ellington and Cecil Taylor. Also, we sit down and break bread and talk about how she came into this music as a child and her role as a band leader and how she composes and writes for musicians. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of Miss Angelica Sanchez performing with her quartet live at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, downtown Jamaica, Queens, here on the Pacer.
Angelica, thank you for having me here today. Let's talk about your album, Sparkle Beans. You have two preeminent jazz legends on your record, and it's a trio project. But you do some things on this album that's unconventional. You reach out to some of your musical heroes on this album. How does this project come together? Um, well, Michael Formanak has been an old friend of mine uh, for over 20 years, and I've played with him in lots of different configurations. Uh, and Billy Hart, I've known since I was about 19. I met him at a music camp in uh, Aspen that uh, Eddie Schuler was running. And uh, he's been a friend for all those years, and I've always wanted to play with him. And when I finally asked him, he goes, why did it take you so long? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really happy to be able to spend some time with him. And uh, He's always been an inspiration to me. Both of them are, my Michael and, and Billy. So. Billy's just so giving with the jazz community. The, the, the elder statesman as well as the younger generation. Well, what are some things that Billy has imparted on you as a musician and as a composer? Well, uh, one of the, the biggest lessons he, he showed me when I was young, I was like 19, um, we were playing a uh, trio and, uh, and at some point he, he stopped me and he goes, you need to go and listen to Shirley Horn. You need to learn about time and space. And I was 19, I didn't know what he meant. Um, and I went and would go hear Shirley Horn as often as I could. And then I started to understand what he meant. Like there was no breath in my music at that age, right? I was just playing a bazillion notes. Um, so that was one of the biggest lessons that he sort of like gently guided me to, right? And when you hear him play, he has tons of breath and space and, you know, so that was probably the biggest lesson I, I learned from him. And, and that goes into your compositions too, right? So that the same concept of time and space, and letting there be breath into the music, right? What about Michael as a bass player? I mean, he's collaborated with some important guys in this idiom. What, what are some things that, and you guys have collaborated before, what, what, what's it like working with him? Oh, he's fantastic. He's, um, so oftentimes I'll go into harmonic lands that might not be exactly clear, maybe nebulous. Um, sometimes I'll play folk melodies and sometimes I'll go in and out of this harmony that might not be always so clear or I might play a voicing that's a little different. And he's always right there with exactly the right note no matter what I'm doing. So it's that feeling that of total trust, like no matter what I play, how unconventional or how it's however it's perceived um, he's always right there i don't have to tell him anything i don't have to use words the billy's the same i don't have to speak to for them to understand what you know what what uh, what the music is because they're in the music in the moment right but that's a uh, and then he has just this huge sound that when i was a kid i heard records with him and i thought that sound is i was always attracted to that sound that was the first thing because he played with Freddie Hubbard, he played right. with a bunch of people. Right. One right. of the last sort of from the uh, um, the generation that is is uh, didn't have really boundaries for worlds. Like there's no straight ahead and no downtown. It's just all music, and he played all of it. Right. So I like that uh, about him.
out to three very important musicians. You channeled Duke Ellington, you channeled Mary Lou Williams, and you reached out to Cecil Taylor. Why did you decide to pay homage to these guys? Well, uh, in my mind, they're all connected, Duke being first and Mary Lou. Um, I always have thought of Mary Lou as being as important as Duke Ellington. Right, maybe not. Uh, has has not not in all the. She may maybe she gets one page in a history book where Duke could fit a whole chapter. Um, but the same with Duke Ellington. He was just uh, so ahead of his time and an innovator, and you know he took these uh, forms and would change them and just no rules really. Right, and he and he he was fearless in his writing and he still is. I still hear. Uh, the music today and it sounds fresh to me and Mary Lou's the same way she was taking big chances in the music and and she mentored so many people you know I, I played a little with Andrew Cyril and he told me stories of going to her apartment in Harlem and I'm like wow you know she was like really the mother of, of, of jazz for so many people um, and I, di I didn't ha I didn't find her music till I was a little older because she wasn't accessible to me like Duke Ellington was, right? There weren't Mary Lou Williams records in the local record store or even in the library where I grew up, but there were Duke Ellington records. Now, she influenced Duke a little bit, too. I, I would imagine she, she would have, yeah. and, and, and I know that Cecil Taylor was definitely influenced by Duke Ellington. Yeah. You know, it, but Cecil... And I'm 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 50, so I I've in the last decade have really gotten into Cecil, and I just think that his concept and approach to music is just so out of the box. What what did Cecil do to you musically as a pianist, but also you do kind of avant-garde, you do improvisation. How has that helped you by listening? I came to Cecil Taylor a little bit later in my life, like in my in my twenties, and uh, maybe the first record I heard him on was with Archie Shep, um, uh, and and funny enough, it was with them. Oh, I'm blanking on who who else is on the record, but they were playing a blues, and he was he was playing he was playing the blues, but he was playing on top of it and underneath it, and. Uh, my ears couldn't figure out what was happening until a little bit later, and then I realized how compositionally he he improvises in the moment, right? And just the sheer virtuosity of his playing really struck me. And I used to go to every concert in New York. Back then he was playing in the, you could go anywhere in the Lower East Side and stand a foot away from him and hear him play, and it was just magical for me to hear him. Uh, take uh, these ideas and develop them, you know, and it, it was so it's so much more than what people realize, right? It's not um, Initially when first people first hear him, they're like, oh, he's banging on the piano, but no, it's so much deeper He, he, he plays he played compositionally among other things, right? He did a lot of other things too And when you hear his compositions, they're just for me, they're magical that I'm really inspired by the, a lot of his compositions And that's why not a lot of people record his compositions um, for good reason, because you know, it's, there's that idea that you don't want to take something to disturb it or mess with it. And but all of those innovators, Duke, Mary Lou, and Cecil, did that. They took things and messed with them. <laughs> they they turned them upside down, and you know, looked at them from different from different perspectives to get uh, to find to find their music, to find what was there for them, right? Do you think Cecil was ahead of his time in his time? I think all three of them were. I think people are still catching up to them. Wow, that's heavy because, you know, we, we just lost Wayne Shorter. That's right. And um, I put Wayne Shorter in the category of Duke Ellington because now that he's gone, I see Mr. Shorter's music being presented like we see Duke Ellington's music, like jazz at Lincoln Center, uh, the large ensembles. I, I do see that. Do you think that? Duke's music still needs some investigation. Do Absolutely. you think that you think that he was quintessentially the jazz go-to guy, along with Billy Strayhorn, as far as composition? I mean, I think um, I think 
even I feel like I've only scratched the surface still you know and I've been listening and studying for a long time there's so much there that you you have to kind of live with the music to get to, to get to know it right so yeah I think all three need to be investigated a little more and people are starting to especially Mary Lou you're, I'm starting to see more um, people talking about her and studying her and when you look at the evolution of, of not just her playing but her compositions I play I do this sometimes for students I teach uh, sometime and uh, uh, I'll play like an early Mary Lou where she's playing like boogie woogie you know and then I'll play a record called zoning where she's playing all this sort of sophisticated chordal harmony and no one imagines it's the same person just like Wayne Shorter, uh, Maestro Wayne Shorter, she kept evolving right to the end. Right. And so did uh, Wayne Shorter, and that's that's why he's such a huge inspiration to so many people. It's it's it's, a, it's remarkable to imagine a person evolving their whole life and just pushing that envelope constantly. All three of those people did that, and that's why I included them on that record. They that I may I recorded that music that I had been living with for so long, you know. There's also a gentleman that I, I did a little digging. Marco Ruiz Armingo? Yeah, Armingo, right, that's right. Now, explain how his music came into your psyche and the connection between him and Duke Ellington. So, uh, I read um, that Duke Ellington studied harmony with him and that Duke Ellington gave him the nickname of Mr. Harmony. I think that's pretty well documented. Um, and a friend of mine sent me a book of piano pieces um, that I fell in love with. And so on that recording is one of his pieces that I arranged uh, uh, for uh, the trio, right? Um, and uh, he's, he was a, a composer that not a lot of people know about. He was a Mexican composer, very prolific, wrote pop tunes, wrote lots of different types of uh, music in different genres. Um, but I was reading something on Duke Ellington, and I saw that name, and I thought, I who that is. And so he's a little hard to find uh, um, in terms of the, the piano music, um, but I, I just fell in love with the, the harmonies. They, they remi it reminded me of Monk and, you know, and Duke and some of the harmonies that uh, I, be I came to love. And so I thought, yeah, this, this feels right. He should be in, in this with, you know, in, in with the other three. So unique individual. Good. You go. Tell me about how you were exposed to the music. Uh, um, 
Yeah, I grew up in Phoenix, and uh, my father had this record collection um, that I wasn't that interested in at the beginning, you know, and uh, there wasn't jazz radio at that time. I must have been like 10 years old, uh, 9 or 10, and a local jazz trio came to my grade school, and they played in the cafeteria, and the caf all the kids just were going crazy and, not, and making noise and not paying attention, and they started playing, and it just drew me in and it felt like they were just playing for me and I was just fascinated. It was a jazz trio, I don't remember who it was. Um, and I ran home and I said, Dad, can I, can I look at your records? I said, do you have any jazz records? He goes, yeah, go ahead. And he just let me devour his record collection. He was like modern jazz quartet, he had Ahmad Jamal, he had Dave Brubeck, he had George Shearing. Um, he had a lot of, he had like Cal Jader, he had a lot of the, um, the Brazilian records with Stan Getz and all the Jobim records he had, I fell in love with those. I wore those out. And then one day he goes, this record's too crazy for me. Maybe you might like it. Um, he had a, a friend of his that was, he was giving him jazz records. And it was Miles Smiles. And I put that on and I, that just did me in for good. I, I had, I told myself, I need everything that Herbie Hancock has ever been on. Um, and I, that's what I did. He took me to the record store once a month. We can get one record. And of course, I didn't know the history of jazz at 10 years old. And then once I learned who Herbie Hancock was, you know, I opened up a book and figured out who Thelonious Monk was and figured out who Charlie Parker was. And right around the time when I was 13, um, Mary McPartland's radio show became syndicated. So now I had access to all these different piano players. Um, and then when I got into high school, um, I would just, I found a bass player and a, and a guitar player and I, they would come over and we would just learn standards. I didn't know what I was doing. And then uh, eventually my, uh, the local uh, professor from the university came to my high school and he was very kind to me and he gave me free lessons for like a couple years, you know, and I, I learned a lot that way. But it was my father's record collection that got me started. You know, I was fortunate that he, and it was like, uh, you know, none of my relatives or cousins were into that music, so I, I was really fortunate that he had sort of these sophisticated tastes in music. Herbie Hancock is very important because Miles really showed how Wayne, Tony, and, and Herbie how to adapt to change. What is it about the changes of Herbie's musical styles throughout his five, six decades that appeal to you and the stuff that you listen to more through, through, through you growing up listening to his music? Well, his harmonic approach um, is very expansive. That's one of my favorite groups still, all those Live at the Plugnickel uh, uh, sessions. I grew up on those. Like, uh, and once I learned standards and saw what they were doing with them and how uh, these standards had breath and, and they, that they would stretch the harmonies and still had this co beautiful cohesiveness together. They would breathe together. It's still one of my favorite groups. Um, but his harmonic concept was what I was initially attracted to. And the way he plays time, it's, it's just, he plays time like smoke or water and he can tip or swing as hard as anybody and, you know, play like fluid. And I just was really attracted to the shapes he was making because they were different it's coming from bebop, but different, more expansive, right? Almost an abstraction of, of uh, the language. So. Isn't it crazy? Because what you're saying is, you nailed it. Because when he shifted to Mawandishi, and then when he went to Headhunters, and then he, he, he took the technology and expanded with the music. Is that a good or a bad thing? It, 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 I, I wouldn't say it's neither. It's just what happened. Right, and it, it's his trajectory. I don't think you uh, can say something is good or bad, right? Technology has always played a role in how musicians develop. Charlie Christensen playing the electric guitar changed the face of music for electric guitar. Everyone wants to play electric, electric guitar after that. The Moog changed things, right? Herbie was big. Uh, um, so many of those groups uh, changed electronic music, electric music for, for, for positive. I think it's positive if you love what you're doing. You know, then I think it's a good thing, but I, I could never judge as to what he thought, right? You know, it's like you, you just follow your path and keep going, and you don't worry if it's good or bad. 
you just keep going. Keep going. Yeah. I want to piggyback on something too. We talked <clears throat> about Mr. Shorter and we talked about Duke Ellington. Chick Corea wrote a lot of music also. Mm -hmm. He's another guy that I see also, he's in the same vein with Wayne where musical ensembles, orchestras are gonna start playing his music. What did Chick Corea do to you musically? How you heard it and how you play it? Well, the first thing, uh, he was, he was very accessible, so I had access to him, right? So like when I was, my sister took me, I think I was 16, and she took me to hear the band with Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea. And Chick Corea was the kind of guy that you could go up to him and talk to him. So I remember going up to him, this kid, and he was really lovely, he talked to me, you know, so. Um, and he, he was always, uh, even right up until the end, he was always uh, uh, very generous in sharing his knowledge, right? So. And, and I got to hear him play a bunch. So, and he's a great composer. And I, I played all those tunes as a kid, right? Because I could, you could get to them. You know, access was always a little bit difficult when I was a kid, till I got a little bit older and, you know, things, uh, I started going to jazz music camps in the summer to try to meet people and try to grow. And, you know. <laughs>
I wanted to, to bring up some, because this is National Women's Month, and women in jazz, you know, are very, very, very important. What you're doing as far as on the band stage and also off the band stage teaching. What are some things that you're teaching women musicians um, as far as finding their voice and dealing with the, the, the gender gap in the music? Because this is a male-dominated industry. Sure. I mean, growing up, um, it took me a minute to figure that out as a kid. Um, but I quickly realized that um, the music should have, is the focus. The work is the focus. Uh, my gender, um, um, music didn't care what my gender was. Now, dealing in the world is a much different thing, right? So, um, but I've always just focused on the work and I always surround myself with people that, that focus on the work and care about the mu music is first, right? So, um, but in terms of the gender gap, that's what I tell young women and, and I tell young men that too. You focus on your work, right? Um, I don't want to play at a, a jazz, a women in jazz festival. I want to play at a jazz festival that everyone's included. I don't like this idea of exclusion. But I understand that people are trying to tip, tip the scale uh, because it's been tipped wrong for a long time. Um, I want to put the idea in young men and women's heads that um, everyone should be included, right? Like, I, I don't want a, a women's month. I want a women's year. I want to, I want to be part of the, everything. Right. So that's how I, I think about it. And the things that happened, like I recognized there were women that came before me. I got tomatoes thrown at them on stage just because they were women. And I, and I make sure to sh show gratitude to the women that came before me. When you, if you read any of the stories about Melba Liston or Mary Lou Williams, how they were brutalized. Yeah. It's terrible. Um, and, and I am afforded a different uh, lifestyle and luxury because of what they went through, because of those, they took those hits, right? It's not to say that it's always been easy or even safe all the time for me, but it wasn't like that. You know, I didn't suffer the same types of injustices that Mary Lou Williams did or Melba Liston did, but I know other women that have. So it's important to talk about it, to make uh, people aware of what happened before so it doesn't keep happening. But I always tell young women, focus on your work. People that, um, that you will be attracted to you for your work are the people you want to be around and they won't care that you're a woman. And at the same time, they will care that you're a woman because you're a human being, right? So uh, uh, this idea of exclusion, I don't like. Yeah. You know, a lot of your contemporaries, Beanie Rosnes, uh, Arco Iris Sandoval, um, there are a lot of women out here that are really, 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 really out here doing it. And as a journalist, I have to make sure that everybody gets equal equal say and um i noticed that some of the jazz press isn't too kind to females when it comes to compositions and, and even their playing what are some things that moving forward now in 2023 we're going to have to do to change that narrative i mean it's hard to change what's in someone's heart right i think the the way i'm dealing with it is is talking to young people because they change, they can change their attitude. It's hard to change somebody's attitude that they've had for 30 or 40 years. And they, their thinking may be off, you know, but I'm always trying to be kind and gentle with those folks to let them know there's so much more happening in the world that you may not be aware of, um, but it's not my job to do that, right? It's my job to keep moving forward and share. And that's why I love teaching because it, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to share. And as I share, I grow, right? So. Um, when you said composition, I, I was Jerry Allen, who was somebody really important to me, um, um, was an amazing composer and uh, beautiful spirit. Yeah, too. just a, an amazing player. Yeah. I, I remember being 16 and uh, somebody telling, discouraging me from from doing what I was doing because it was a little different than uh, what they were doing. And I believed them, you know, because you're a kid. And I remember getting a year of the dragon, Jerry Allen and Charlie Hayden and Paul Motion, and hearing that going, she's somebody influenced by Monk and she's doing it, she has her own language. And that changed my whole life. I didn't listen to anybody from that point on. And I still don't, but um, I still do what I want. Um, but that was a turning point for me. And I, I was fortunate enough to meet her a little bit and talk to her, such a, a beautiful, but her compositions are ridiculous. 
you know, and her arranging skills were ridiculous. And no one talks about that, you know, other than, I know Terry Lynn Carrington talks about her a lot because they were, they were fast friends and yeah. they were important to each other. Um, but she's someone like, she should, you know, people should be playing her music more, you know. At my school, I have a, a women composers ensemble, and we play the music of, uh, of Jerry and a lot of people. A lot That's of fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Keeping Jerry's, keeping Jerry's name alive out there too. That's beautiful. Angelic, when you are playing, or when you are writing, how do your ideas meet with your playing? Is it a spirit thing, or do things actually come? Because jazz is all about improvisation. It's about the infinite. You don't know what's going to happen once you play that last note. How, how does it come together for you? I mean, for me, uh, the music's always there. It's always been there, even as a child. The, the trick is to shut that little voice in your, in your head that clouds, that clouds your, your thoughts. So to be focused, and it's almost like a meditation, but the music is always there. The music never lets you down because it's all around you, right? If you can quiet your mind enough to get to it, um, it's there. It's, it's always there. And, uh, people say, do you ever run out of ideas? No, <laughs> I never do. <laughs> I, have, I run out of time. And then, you know, people have, we have to sleep. I always wished as I, that I didn't need to sleep. <laughs> but it's, it's there, it's always there. You get ready to go on the road and musicians, when they go around the world, they, they listen to different music styles and they see other musicians and they learn from the people that they're around, as you should. Do you find that playing jazz overseas is totally different than playing to American audiences? Um, it depends where, you know, like some places um, can be more attentive uh, in their audiences. Um, uh, but I, I think people are the same wherever you go, right? And they're and if they love the music, they're they're there. And the only thing I tell audiences, no matter where I'm at, is um, especially if they don't know me or what I what my music is is like. Um, I just say all I can ask you to do is sit in the chair and come on this journey with me, right? And don't judge. Can you get through one hour without judging anything? It's really hard because humans we, we naturally judge, right? Um, and if you can approach music from that point of view, from being non-judgmental, it, it opens up to you. So much more will become open to you in the world also, right? Not just in, in music. But that's why music transcends everything, right? So. Angelica Sanchez, what does black American music mean to you? So I, I was fortunate this, uh, this last year to teach uh, jazz history. And I made it very clear that it's a black American art form, right? Black Americans started the music. And, and a lot of times students will ask me, well, does that mean that only black folks can play the music? And I say, no, of course not. Um, uh, black, black Americans started the music. We don't know where it's gonna go. It's up to you, it's up to you, the new generation, right? But it's, it's so important to, to make sure people know of the origins of the music and who made it and how and why, right? Um, so that's what it means to me, but it's, it, it's ever expanding, just like Afrofuturism, the concept of, of imagining what something could be, right? I love the idea of, of that Ornette Coleman talked about as there being no subservient roles in the music because he wanted life to, 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 mirror, to mirror that, right? So this idea of racism and, and things that were segregated, he, he mimicked that in, in his music, right? And came up with a concept and an idea to support that. Um, but it's the music's for everyone, but I'm very clear with people as to who, who started it, who made it, you know? So uh, that's what it means to me, but it's ever growing and ever expansive. So I, it's not something I could define uh, with words. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace. I'd like to personally thank the incomparable Angelica Sanchez for her time. For more information on our upcoming tour dates, please follow her online at angelicasanchez.com and also support her current album, Sparkle Beans, which is now available on iTunes and Amazon.com. I'd like to personally thank the staff and management at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning in Jamaica, Queens, for their warm hospitality. People, I can't stress this more than enough. 
Please like, share, and subscribe. Share and leave comments on my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo, as well as follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.